got their noses in a book. They're reading words, you know. The uh, violence in these is extreme. I was looking at, uh, I, I recall my Fantastic Four days or my Spider-Man days. No one ever lost limbs or bled all over the page, at least not to my recollection. I still got a few hundred of them stowed away in somewhere in Ohio. Is that a good development? I mean, it's all cartoons. I think that there, there's a real peculiar thing that happens in comic books like, uh, there's, a, there's a comic book when I was a kid called Little Archie, oh. who was Archie as a kid. Now, Little Archie, for some reason, was all violence. Archie was getting in fist fights, he was battling giant turtles, he would, you know, stuff that wouldn't happen in an Archie comic, and it was obviously aimed at littler kids than Archie was. I just think that when kids are between, you know, eight and 10, or even younger, they're ready to, you know, go for blood, essentially. And as they begin to get older, they begin to realize that there's more socially acceptable ways of but in fighting and uh, in this era, and we are roughly contemporaries, kids wanted to go for blood. They still wanted to go for blood, but it was not retailed out by the buckets in the pages of. I don't care if you look at at, at Doctor Strange or the Avengers or the Silver Surfer. There was no that kind of hemorrhaging. But we probably would have liked to have seen it. My guess. I mean, people want to play out these fantasies <coughs> in some way or another, and uh, and I think comic books just basically caught up with films. But, uh, you know, you know 12 around, year old... around the time of the Batman, Dark Knight things, they were just like putting into comic books what had been in action films for a long time. Mm -hmm. But action films that come with an R rating. 12-year-olds would love to watch uh, no, X-rated videos know, it, as well. They, they, they can see, I mean, James Bond was plenty violent for kids, and it's a family film. Well, I think there's also a common misconception that because it's a comic, kids are going to want to pick it up. And... I mean, if you look at something like, like Sin City, it's in black and white. I mean, it has a very sophisticated graphic look to it. Now, now believe me, I mean, I worked with children's material. And, you know, if you get too sophisticated, they just don't, they don't want to look at it. I mean, I don't think kids should be, I, I don't think kids should be seeing something like the Terminator movie necessarily. I mean, I thought those were very violent films and very disturbing films. And lots of kids saw them. And lots of kids saw them, yeah. And, you know, uh, it's interesting, actually, because in Japan, I had this argument with someone recently, in Japan, the, everyone reads comics. There are zillions of comics. They're called manga. And um, they are, you think these are violent, you want to see those. They are just unbelievable. I mean, mind-bogglingly bizarre. You know, what you have to understand is a main part, there's no argument, a main part of the comic book industry is fostered on the teenage male power fantasies. Now, or or sub-teenage. Sub I mean, yeah, I mean, that's different. I mean, there's, there's Disney comics, Harvey comics, there are comics. But I mean, I think yeah. the power fantasies are aimed at between 8 and 12 year olds more than older kids. I don't, I don't know. Well, no, that's a good point. I mean, I think it is aimed very much at... at what do we mean by a power fantasy? Well, I think we'd all like to be big and strong and fly around. I mean... Has the media changed for the better or for the worse in the last 35 years? I think for the better. I mean, uh, the comics code had a very stifling effect. What was the comics code? The comics code started in the 50s. There was a, a psychologist, Frederick Wortham, who started this ball rolling. He wrote a book called Seduction of the Innocent, which is pointing out what he felt were very uh, negative images in comics. Um, he, he, if you read the book in contemporary light, it's really slanted. I mean, he was a very caring guy, but he kind of had the, the wrong uh, thrust at that time. Let's summon his ghost up. Okay. <laughs> and he, he's that's looking at this. Well, that's what I may try and do that. Summon his ghost up and have him take a look at The Dark Knight Returns or Sin City by Frank Miller or Love and Rockets. What would he say? Well, actually, Wortham was in favor of personal expression. So, I mean, he didn't think that children should be exposed to really hyper-violent images. I don't think anyone's in favor of that. So, uh, But I think he, Wortham's belief was that uh, in the 50s, which is when he was uh, running rampant, you know, the belief was that uh, he had the juvenile delinquent problem. He thought comic books were the cause of it. Obviously, comics came under the strongest form of censorship that has ever been uh, applied to any medium, and I dare say we still have the problem of juvenile delinquency. What is the image that you take away of women, for example, 
uh, uh, Michael Lucid from these books? Well, um, from the more mainstream, like Youngblood or something. Yeah, from well, what you read. Well, the, the big difference is that um, these superhero comic books, they really objectify women and their bodies and these, like, insane, exaggerated bodies, you know, just these, like, you know, look like sculptures or something. It's very unrealistic, you know, for male readers and for female readers, you know, I'm sure it sets up an unrealistic standard. My girlfriend is my biggest critic of the way women are handled in comics, but I constantly think it's just so hypocritical when, um, they say, oh, look at how, uh, I, d I did a poster. It's of this girl named Glory, and she's like a Playboy model. Um, she's fully clothed, but um, she's sitting on the beach, and, and she's in her clothes, but she's very well endowed, very shapely. Um, and my girlfriend goes, how can you draw this? How can you draw this? And I go, are you kidding me? Why, what about these five guys I draw with these huge pecs and huge biceps and triceps and this, you know, they're tight ass, you know? When I draw the men's butt, I go, hey, I know the girls out there want a tight ass. So I'll give the guy a, a nice perky butt. Heidi, are you happy with the way, and let's take all the genres, that women are portrayed in this? No, of course not. But how would you have a change? How would I have a change? Just have more well-rounded female characters. But again, I, to be perfectly honest about it, I'm no more disturbed by the images of women in comics than I am by anywhere else. You watch a sporting event on TV, all the women in the uh, ads are portrayed as, you know, these bimbos and baby suits. Then beer commercial, yeah. I mean, it's not just comics. Has it gone downhill from the days of Wonder Woman and uh, Mrs. No, Fantastic Four? No, absolutely Ford? not. No, no, no. There's a lot more female heroes in comics now. There's a lot more women creating comics, and uh, I, there's some some excellent female characters in in Love and Rockets. There's in the work of uh, you know Carol Lay, uh, Trina Robbins, um, some of the other ones, uh, Linda Barry. I mean, there's some wonderful female characters out there in their work. Has this phenomenon peaked, or is it going to cross over into uh, the, the, the new super media culture? Are we going to see comics penetrating these other forms like television, radio, and now um, interactive video, et cetera? Absolutely. Uh, I, mean, I mean, one of the reasons why the DC heroes still exist is because they're part of Warner Communications, whereas Marvel seems to not have that mega corporate hookup, and so their even more popular comic books don't seem to translate onto the big screen ever. And so, do you expect then, Jim, that these first generation books by artists are going to somehow springboard into second media, third media as the commercialization of the characters grows? Probably. It's all about corporate ownership of marketable images and concepts. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, uh, from slightly more abstract, uh, uh, comics are images. You know, w our media, our culture is becoming increasingly image driven. Mm -hmm. And I think, I mean, comics have, do have a much wider acceptance now. The images, I mean, people wear them like, you know, we used to wear feudal colors. Um, and definitely, that's the way we're moving towards the image. Jim Shaw, Heidi McDonald, Michael Lucid, thank you for joining us on Life and Time. Well, what do you think? Has the comic book world changed in ways that shock you right to us? Let us know what you think. Care of Life and Times, viewer comments, 4401 Sunset Boulevard, Los Angeles, California, 90027, or phone it in. 213-664-4159. As always, we need your name, your address, and your phone number, and permission to use your comment on the air if you would so desire. That's it for this edition of Life and Times. See you next time. Good night. This edition of Life and Times will be repeated at midnight tonight. Tomorrow night, former Vice President Dan Quayle will be talking with David Frost. They'll discuss Mr. Quayle's career, his ambitions, and his new book tomorrow at 9. We open Pandora's box right after Newsline.